Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Drumenis. If you're a member here or a visitor, this is your first time, you're very, very welcome. Um, usually you'd see Sam up here. Sam's our minister, but um, Sam has got the weekend off, so you've got to uh, deal with me this morning. Uh, my name's Daniel. I'm the family and discipleship worker here. Um, if you're here in the church building, or um, maybe if you're watching at home, um, especially welcome to you. And um, We pray uh, that you know the Lord's blessing this morning as we meet around his word couple of announcements you've seen them on the screen not to labor them too much Um, this Sunday is the last Sunday that we'll be meeting in person until Sunday the 13th of December Lord willing Um, so just be aware of that if you weren't already aware of that Uh, we'll be um, still be having our services online Uh, and there'll also be CDs available Um, if that if you'd like a CD or if you know someone who maybe would want one please do get in contact with myself Sam or one of the elders be happy to arrange that as well Although the building is closed, we still are the body of Christ. We're still the church, and uh, the church is alive and living. Um, so any pastoral issues that still come up, please do um, get in t- contact with Sam, one of your elders, um, and also look out for each other at this time. Um, we knew the, uh, the effects of the last full lockdown was hard on so many, and even two weeks will be hard on many too, so please do um, look out for each other. As well, um, if you're in... What, lower sixth, or if you've left fifth year, you're maybe just started working, you're in that kind of young adult age group. And um, this afternoon, uh, young adults are meeting on Zoom at four o'clock. If you need the Zoom link, um, come chat to myself, come chat to Kate, and we'd love to get you involved in that. As well, uh, this week's midweek prayer time, uh, it was originally meant to be in the hall, uh, but now we've decided to put it on Zoom at eight o'clock on Wednesday night. Um, the link will be circulated, and if you need the link, um, if you haven't got it by Wednesday, um, do contact Sam, myself, or one of the elders. But as we say every week, we're not here for announcements. We're here to worship the living God. Psalm 84 says this, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And later in the psalm, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. And again, blessed is the one who trusts in you. God dwells among his people, both individually by his spirit and collectively as we meet together. What an incredible truth to consider this morning that as we meet in this way, on his day, he dwells with us as much as he does throughout the week. So as his his word is read this morning, as we hear it explained, as we respond in praise, and as we bring our prayers before the Lord, let us say, like the psalmist, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord. Let our faith rise and let our trust rise as we consider Christ our great high priest in the heavens. Let us find our rest in him. Let us long to know him. Let us hate what displeases him in our lives. And let us find our joy and satisfaction in him as we wait with sure and steady hope for the day we will dwell in his presence forever. Let's praise God um, as we remain seated, as we sing the beautiful opening hymn, God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. Oh, the miracle of mercy, Jesus reaches down to me. Let's remain seated as we sing.
Well, as we've spent time praising our great God, let's draw before him through Jesus in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you, our King and God, and we praise you for your greatness. How in your power you made all that we see, taste and hear, and all that we enjoy in this world, and we bow and worship at your magnificence and your love in allowing us to know those things. In your love you made us, you made us in your image for your pleasure and our good. We thank you that you made us to reflect your glory, enjoy your goodness, and find our life and being with you. Truly, our hearts are restless and until we find rest in you. Yet even though we've seen and known your goodness and we've known your majesty, um, we know that in our hearts we have turned from you um, this week and even today. We realize that in the light of your glory, we're full of darkness, full of sin, full of selfishness, full of pride, full of evil. Your word reminds us uh, so clearly and powerfully, no one seeks after God. No one does good, not even one. We've fallen short of your glory. We've fallen short of your standard and your law. We've turned our backs on your word, even today. And we ask that you would forgive us. Have mercy on us. That you would cleanse us afresh this morning. And that you would do so through your son, Jesus. We thank you that in him we have a great high priest who gave the gift and offering of himself on the cross to reconcile us to you. We thank you and we rest in your gracious promise that if anyone does sin, that he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We pray this morning as we consider your word and that you would help us see Christ for who he is. We pray that you would show us where we sin, that you would restore us as we hear your promises. And we pray you would apply your word to our heads and then into our hearts so that you would change us. And we ask that you would be glorified as we follow Christ, our great high priest of the new covenant. O Lord of hosts, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to turn to God's word. We're going to continue our series in Hebrews. Um, and we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 8. And Lee Brown is going to do our reading for us. Um, so over to Lee. The point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer gifts prescribed by the law. They serve there at a, at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declared the Lord. This is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, 
and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Thank you, Lee, for uh, reading for us. Now, boys and girls, um, both here and online, um, I wonder if you have ever made any promises before. Hands up if you've ever made a promise. I've made a promise before. Yeah? You guys have all made promises, I'm sure. Mummies and daddies, granny and grandas um, have all made promises too in their lives. Now, I want you to stay in your seats. I um, want you to put your hand up if you've made this particular promise. Have you ever promised to tidy your room? Oh, Abigail's not so sure. Yeah, no, she has. She's promised. Whether she has or not, that's for Paul and Ruby to decide. Um, okay, put your hands down again. Who has promised to help put away the dishes? I have in my house. No, not many. No, no, no boys and girls have promised to help. Yes, a couple down at the front here. Um, Putting away the dishes is probably one of the funner parts. Washing them's not so fun. Has any of you ever promised to help cut the grass? Yes, couple, yes there's a couple of budding um, horticulturists around. Um, good stuff. And finally, who has promised that they won't play their Xbox, Nintendo, Switch, whatever games console you have past a certain time? I've made that promise in the past to mum and dad. Yeah, there's a couple, yes, there's definitely a couple here who have games consoles and have maybe promised um, that they would not play it past a certain time, but they go and do it anyway. I have definitely done that in the past. Boys and girls, we make promises all the time, don't we? You guys have just shown me that you've made promises. Sometimes we keep them, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we struggle to trust other people who make promises to us. Maybe there's someone at school who's made a promise to you and maybe they've not kept their word. It's hard. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? You know, in the Bible, God makes lots of promises. And guess what? He keeps them. God doesn't break his promises. He doesn't say he'll do one thing and go and do the other. He's faithful, he's good, and he's true. These are all true things we know of God. Today in our Bible reading that Lee just read for us, we see that God makes a couple of promises to his people. Um, and his people are those who trust by faith in Jesus. He says to us in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 and 12, he says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. He also says, I will be their God and they will be my people, as well as I will forgive their wickedness. I will forgive their sin all the ways in which we say no to God, all the ways we turn our backs on him. And he will remember those sins no more. Boys and girls, he promises to forgive us of our sin. We can be sure that when we say sorry to God, trusting in Jesus that what he has done for us on the cross is enough for us, he will forgive. He's not going to back out on that. He not only promises to forgive us, boys and girls, but he promises to help us walk in a way that pleases him. He helps us to obey him. That's what he um, means when he says, I'll write, their, write my laws in their minds and on their hearts. He'll give us new minds, new hearts that long to obey him, that love him above anything else. Sometimes uh, what we hear in church, like right now, or maybe um, at home, or maybe in Sunday school when uh, that was on, uh, maybe some of those things can be confusing to you. I know some things I hear in church confuse me. Um, and I'm a little bit older than you guys. But you know what? God has given us people to help us understand what God has said in his word. He's given you mummies and daddies, grannies and grandas, aunts and uncles, uh, BB leaders, Sunday school teachers, youth club leaders, YF leaders, Bible class leaders, um, people who um, know and love Jesus and want to teach you how awesome he is. That's one of God's good gifts to us. That's how much he loves us. So we would do well to listen to them. Boys and girls, as I said, we make promises that we struggle to keep, God, but God makes promises that he always keeps. We can trust him today. We can trust his word whenever it's read. We can trust what we find in it. And we can trust Jesus, because Jesus is God's greatest promise to us. He's the one who saves us. He's the one who forgives. He's the one who brings us to God. And he always keeps his promises Boys and girls, you listened so well there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're going to turn um, together 
uh, to what we read there um, in God's Word. I will say, boys and girls, there is some worksheets out in the out in the vestibule there as well. If you picked one up on the way in, great. You can go out and grab one now um, to help you um, as we go through the sermon. Um, okay. I wonder at this time of year um, what one of the great joys of your life is. Perhaps um, it's walking around the mall on a lovely um, autumnal day where the sun is splitting the trees. Maybe it's walking around the roads of Hamilton's Bawn, Rich Hill, Armagh, um, and you see the beauty of your surroundings. Um, I know whenever I first started dating Kate, um, one of the things that I noticed first off was the orchards and uh, their beauty. The vast amount of orchards in this area, uh, truly amazing. But one of the things about autumn that's quite interesting is that the sun is lower in the sky throughout the day. It's not as high as it is in the summer. We all know that as a fact. Um, whenever the sun is quite low, it casts long shadows. It makes things a little darker around us as well, but it also makes normal-sized plants, normal-sized trees and objects appear really, really large. Um, we all see that their shadows are not the object it portrays. Um, have you ever tried to grab a shadow before? Have you ever tried to sit on a shadow, assuming it's a chair? Um, you'd look like a bit of a fool trying to grab a shadow or trying to sit down on nothing. We all know that shadows are not the object they portray. Shadows are more like a signpost, and they show us that the object is coming from there. It's there in front of you. When someone's walking around a corner, you know, oh, someone's coming because there's a shadow in front of you. Um, but you would be foolish to start talking to the shadow. The shadow is a signpost. The shadow is not the substance that we find the beauty in. The Christians that the letter um, of Hebrews was written to, they were tempted to see in the shadows the substance of their faith, the substance of their walk with Christ. Remember, in, as we've been going through Hebrews, um, there's been this constant temptation for the Hebrew Christians to go backwards to go back to what they knew, to go back to um, the old Judaism, the old system of the priests and the sacrifices and reliance on observing God's law for their salvation. In turn, they were in danger of not only walking back to the old shadows, but walking away from Jesus, the one who they'd been taught of. The writer of this letter has been attempting to console them, to comfort them, but to show them the danger of walking away from Christ. It's a message we need to hear in the 21st century, in 2020. We need to hear again that Jesus is still superior to anything else that you could rely on for your rescue from sin, for your life with Christ, for your new life in Him. So where are we in Hebrews? How did we get to Hebrews chapter 8? Well, we've seen already that God is... Our Jesus is God's final authoritative word to us. Um, he's the founder and author of our faith. He's the greatest prophet, greater than Moses, and um, for whom the law came to us. He's the one for whom we are brought to rest, both rest from our sin and eternal rest with God. And we see from chapter 5 how Jesus is the great high priest. We, he starts that exposition of how Jesus is the great high priest um, in chapter 5 and um, in those surrounding chapters, we know we can go to the great high priest for mercy and grace in our time of need. The writer then warns them not to run um, from these central core meaty truths throughout Scripture, but instead they're to feed on them. They're to grow in maturity. They're not to go back to um, the, the milk, the, the baby food, if you want to put it that way. They're to grow he then warned them in chapter 6 of the real danger of professing faith in Christ, but never possessing faith in Christ. Yet he also comforted them. He said, we can be assured because our salvation rests on the promise, not on our acts. We returned then in chapter 7 last week uh, to Jesus as the high priest, one like Melchizedek, this um, priest of a different order, this random figure in the Old Testament, and how that assures us and shows us that Jesus is supreme. Now in chapter 8 that we just read, God speaking in and through his word shows us that Jesus is the better high priest we have who serves in a better place and brings us the blessings of a better covenant. Let's pray 
before we begin and ask the Lord's help um, to give us help according to his word. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we open your written word, that you, by your Spirit, would help us see, would help us trust, and help us rest in Christ, your living word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So firstly, we'll break that um, summarizing sentence down. Jesus, the better high priest, we have in verse 1, the writer pauses. It's as if he's about to summarize what he's just said in chapter 7. He says, this is the point we're trying to make. We do have such a high priest. Now, we should also pause with the writer here because this is a really important point. If you're not familiar with the role of a priest, a priest was one in the Old Testament who was called to work before God on behalf of the people. They represented the people. They offered up sacrifices in the tabernacle and then the temple and on their behalf. It's so that the people would receive forgiveness of sin and the ways in which they had rejected God and his word. Chapter 7, as we talked about, has shown us that Jesus is not just any old priest. Um, he's one in the order of Melchizedek, a greater priesthood than the one set up in Moses' time. Um, in the same vein as Melchizedek, Jesus is both a priest representing, working on behalf of the people, but he's also the true king. Remember, he's the king of righteousness, the king of peace. He's the substance, in a word, of what Melchizedek pointed towards. Jesus is the eternal son of God, appointed by God's promise, whose ministry and service as a priest isn't halted by death, so his work is effectual forever. Jesus' priestly work is perfect. It's once for all as he offers himself up, um, and he doesn't offer animals up. He offers himself for the sins of the people. And what does the writer want us then to pause and remember? Well, it's simply underlined there. Jesus is the better high priest we have. There's no mere possibility of this better high priest. We have him. It's not a dream. This high priest exists. He lives today. His name is Jesus. He lives right now. We have him and belong to him right now through faith and repentance. If we belong to Christ, we have him now. It's not a pipe dream. He's our high priest forever. He's sat down in the words of verse 1. He sat down in the Father's right hand. His work for you is done. The priests set up in the time of Moses, and they did not sit. If you go back and read um, in Exodus and, and the instructions for building the tabernacle, you'll, you'll notice there is no seats. There's no pews set up for the priests. They weren't to sit. They offered sacrifices continually, daily, on the people's behalf. But Jesus has sat down, and he won't have to get up again. He's not waiting for us to get our act together before his work becomes effectual on our, on our behalf. Um, he hasn't forgotten to do something on the cross. He hasn't forgotten to do something in his life. He hasn't forgotten to do something in his resurrection. One commentator puts it this way. There is nothing more for him to do to win us salvation, to win us rescue from sin, to win us rest with God. But there's nothing more for us to do but rest with joy in him. Like Melchizedek, Jesus is also our king. He sits at the right hand of the throne. Um, it's the place of kingly authority in the Bible. Jesus is our priest king who rules and reigns in justice, righteousness, grace, and mercy. What does that mean? He will do his people no injustice. Um, the, the late R.C. Sproul used to say, um, when God shows um, mercy to one, he, sh he does not show injustice to another. He always shows justice to those who deserve it and mercy to to those who don't. He does no one injustice. In Christ, there is no such thing as injustice. He is gentle and lowly, and we can go to him. We can take great comfort in that this morning. Um, we have a priest, a great high priest, a better high priest, who has done what is necessary for us to know God, to be reconciled to him, to be in right relationship with him. Because Jesus is the priest king, we also have no need to fear he saves us from our enemies, the sin, sin, death, the devil. It's both in the here and now and then. Jesus is the better high priest we have.
But the writer of Hebrews goes on. He doesn't pause there. He keeps going. Not only do we have this better high priest right now in Jesus, but we also have a high priest in a better place. We already saw this hint of that in verse 1. Uh, but the writer continues in verse 2, Jesus serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord and not by man. The tabernacle in the Old Testament was um, a permanent, kind, or, sorry, a temporary dwelling and where God dwelt with the Israelites when they were in the wilderness as they traveled to the promised land. It was before the, per, the semi-permanent temple was built in Jerusalem. If you keep reading from the Ten Commandments on um, in Exodus in your Bibles, uh, you'll find instructions for building the, temp or the tabernacle. Now, what the writer is saying here is, you know, he's not saying that the tabernacle was some kind of false thing. It was wrong. It was awful. It was evil. God truly dwelled there amongst his people in the tabernacle. Just because it was built by men's hands doesn't mean it was false. But the point the writer of Hebrews is saying is that it wasn't final. It wasn't permanent. It wasn't forever. Contrast that with the true tabernacle we read of here. The true tabernacle is one God sets up so it will last. And this is what the earthly tabernacle and the temple were pictures of. In verse 5, um, we're told that um, those priests set up under Moses um, serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. Moses built the tabernacle according to what God had told him when he was up Mount Sinai in the presence of God. He was to model after the very, he was the model of the tabernacle after the very presence of God, which is the real heavenly place. And that heavenly place that Moses set up, that the tabernacle would come later, would point to, is where Jesus serves right now as our great high priest. It's where he has gone to offer his gift and sacrifice of himself on our behalf. In verse 3, he doesn't do it in the earthly temple of his day. He couldn't be a priest. So verse 4 tells us he couldn't be like one set up under Moses because he wasn't of the right blood. He wasn't of the right tribe. He wasn't a Levite. He didn't have the right genealogy. But he's a greater high priest, as we've already said. He's one after Melchizedek. He offers the gift of himself in a better heavenly place. And this information, this truth that um, the writer of Hebrews was put in this letter would have comforted the Hebrew Christians greatly. One commentator observes that in that moment, those hardy Christians were being criticized for having no priest, no visible priest. Some were probably mocking them. Where is your priest? Here's our priest. They're in the temple ministering for us. Where's yours? No wonder a lot of them went back. They trusted what they could see. They found more comfort in that. But they and we do have a high priest. But he's not one that ministers here on earth. He serves us in the heavenly places and has served us there. He's offered the great gift of himself that all of the other sacrifices that came before him pointed towards. Now, why does that matter? I've just told you all that. Why does it matter? That Jesus is our high priest who has offered himself as our sacrifice in heaven before the Father is of vast importance to us because he's offered his sacrifice, his sacrificial atoning death on the cross where we need it most before our heavenly Father who we have wronged. His work secures the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy we require and the mercy and grace that we require that he secured for us chapter 9 would go on and say that is an eternal redemption a never-ending redemption a never-ending inheritance that will not fade or tarnish his work before the father who's who we have wronged is forever it doesn't tarnish it doesn't fade have you ever considered that that the forgiveness that God has given you in Christ if you belong to him lasts forever? It rests on Jesus, not on you. That's why it lasts. Maybe you doubt this morning, perhaps, that you have enough faith to last the course, to reach that place. Maybe you felt like that at times in the past. Have you ever looked at another person and thought, I would love to have the faith of that person? You know, they're so strong, they're so sure of what they believe. 
I know I have. But if, is that, if that is what you fear this morning, if that is what causes you to doubt this morning, then fear not. Christ serves you and has served you in a better place, in an eternal place. So in guaranteeing your forgiveness. It's not big faith. It's not strong faith. It's not sure faith that saves. But it's true faith. And true faith rests on Jesus alone. And his work is done. He sat down. It's forever in the heavenly places. So you can look to him this morning. And you can rest. That is food for our souls this morning. That Jesus served us eternally in the heavenly places. Jesus is our great high priest we have, who ministers in the heavens for us. But Hebrews 8 has gone on um, to give us an even greater picture of the work of Christ in our behalf. We find that he is the high priest who brings us the blessings of a better covenant. In verse 6, we read that Jesus' ministry is better than that of the priest set up under Moses, because the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. It's founded on better promises. Now, there's a really important term here that we need to get our heads around before we go any further, um, something we read a lot, but maybe we're not quite sure what it means. It's the word covenant. What's a covenant? Well, a covenant, according to one commentator, is defined as an agreement between two parties that formalizes their relationship. It contains promises, conditions, and it contains signs. They remind us of the party's obligations that they've made. The easiest way to think about this is, think of a marriage. Any of you are married here today or have been married in the past. A marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman. They make promises to each other to love, care, cherish, support each other for life. They take on the obligations and the conditions of faithfulness, of purity. Whatever the weather, in sickness and in health, Till death do they part. And what's the sign of marriage? What is the sign that they give each other that, no, I will do this and I will be reminded of this? It's a ring. Circular. Where's the end point of a ring? There is no end point. It keeps going. It reminds them of the covenant they made to love each other forever. God deals with humans by way of covenant. He makes the first move to relate to us because he made us. The whole Bible is framed through a series of these covenants that God makes with people. Let me summarize some of the ones that you've maybe seen before. There's the covenant of redemption. It's um, the covenant that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit made with each other before the foundation of the world to save and redeem a people for his glory. And we see a glimpse of this in John chapter 6, verse 37. And when Jesus speaks of those who the Father has given me, The Father has appointed people and he gives them to the Son to save. There's the covenant of works. We're very familiar with that. God makes it with Adam in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 2, 16 to 17, we read, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you will surely die. There is the blessing of life through obedience the curse of death for disobedience. We know what happened. We know the story well, don't we? Adam and Eve rejected God's gracious commands and they forfeited life. They plunged all of us, all of their ancestors, all of, their, um, all of those who came after. They plunged us into the curse of sin and death. But that's not where the story ends. There is another covenant in Scripture. It's super important. It's one called the covenant of grace. It's where God promises grace, pardon, rescue, righteousness to people. And what is the condition of that covenant? The condition of that covenant is not obedience, but faith. Stay with me here. This is really, really important. The covenant of grace that God makes with people, it's not just stated once, but at a number of stages throughout the Bible. It's made through a number of covenants that we read of, um, but there is only one overarching covenant of grace. Think of the covenant with Noah. Think of the rainbow. Think of uh, the covenant with Abraham. Your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. 
Think of the covenant with Moses as he um, delivered the people out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the hands of the Egyptians. Think of the one with David. One of his sons will always be on the throne of Israel. And finally, this new covenant that we read off in Hebrews 8. Jesus spoke of this new covenant. He spoke of the blood of the new covenant. That's what we celebrated last week in communion. These covenants are all part of the one covenant of grace. They are all of the same substance, uh, which is God's gracious promise to save us in Jesus. But they do have different administrations. Um, They all look slightly different on the outward appearance. Let me try and explain. Imagine you're going down to Fruitfield, um, or maybe Macari's, if you prefer Macari's for your ice cream. Uh, You go get ice cream after a long, hard week of work, or maybe school. Uh, When you get ice cream, you get whatever flavor you want. It's great. So many flavors. But it's typically served to you in two ways. One in a tub, or two on a cone. I don't know about you, but I used to be a tub person, but now I am a cone person. It's the ultimate ice cream experience. Um, But what do you receive in both the tub and on a cone? Do you receive two different things? No. You receive ice cream, of course. Uh, The substance is the same, but the way it's administered is different. That's what we're trying to, to explain here. Jesus is the substance of all of these different administrations, the one to Noah, the covenant to Abraham, the covenant to Moses. Jesus is what they all pointed towards. That's through whom those people were saved. He's the substance, the one through whom grace comes to us. If you ever have time to go home this afternoon, read Romans chapter 4. It makes it so abundantly clear that those in the Old Testament were saved not by their attempts to keep the law, but by God's grace through faith, just as we are. There's no two ways of salvation in the Bible. All are saved by grace through faith in his promise to save. Let me say in passing, does that not change how we read our Bibles? Maybe um, if you get up in the morning and read your Bible day by day, um, I wonder how you read your Bible. At youth group one night as a teenager, I remember that um, someone with all the best intentions in the world um, said the Bible was basic instructions before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E. Maybe you've heard that before. It's well-intentioned, but it doesn't give us the full picture. Um, It's much more than just bits of instruction, bits of history. The whole Bible is revelation. It's revelation of who God is, of what he has done for us in the face of Jesus Christ. So the Old Testament, when we read it, um, we don't just brush over it and say, that was for the people back then. The Old Testament is something we read as fully inspired, fully authoritative for us today. And of course, while we need to read the Bible carefully, we need to read um, the Old Testament laws carefully and with reference to Christ, we do need to let the whole Bible interpret itself. You know who the best interpreter of the Bible is? It's not Sam. It's the Bible itself. The Bible interprets itself. Even in the list of names, the odd stories, the fierce military battles, the prophecies which confound us to this day, it all leads us in one direction, and that's to Jesus Christ, the substance of the promise. This is what Hebrews, if you could sum up Hebrews, I reckon that's an all right summary tells us time and time again, Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the substance. He's what we anticipate in the Old Testament. To go back to the shadows then, to go back to the copies, to go back to the old administrations and rely on them is to make a mockery of Christ. It's to make a mockery of the things that those things represented. It's to make a mockery of the revelation of our gracious God. Remember the Hebrew Christians were pressurized to do just this by the Jews that they knew, maybe that they grew up with. So in the rest of chapter 8, we see the greatness of this new covenant, the full and final update, if you want to put it that way, the full and final edition. It's incredible. It's full of great, gracious blessings to us in Christ. Let's unpack some of those. Um, The new covenant is better because it's founded on better promises. Um, The old covenant that was in view was likely the covenant God makes with Moses and through which the law and the priestly system is set up, but that addition wasn't perfect. God found fault with it. It couldn't ultimately produce the obedience required. 
We read last week in chapter 7 that the law made nothing perfect. The law highlights our sin. The law does not help us obey because we are fallen people. We see this in verses 8 to 9 here. God found fault with the people. He quotes from Jeremiah 31 here to underscore this. Um, It gives them and us great hope. Um, The context of Jeremiah 31 from which um, this portion of Scripture is lifted from. Um, Jerusalem was about to fall to the Babylonians. God's judgment was to fall in his wayward people. But his people were not without hope. God is still faithful to his promise, to his covenant of grace, and he would restore them. He would do so through the final addition, the new covenant. God promises to make a new covenant with his people better than the one he had made with Moses. And that was because it would produce what was required. Our sinfulness, as we've mentioned, does not have the last laugh. God does, and his faithfulness to his covenant of grace is restated in the new covenant. What does God promise then in this new covenant? Well, they're on the screen there, but let's go through them. What do we receive through Christ, the substance of this promise? First, God promises that I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. God command, God's commands used to be written on stone tablets, um, but now they'll be written on our minds and in our hearts. What do we mean by that? Well, Romans 12, 1 tells us that um, God will renew our minds. He will change our minds. He will uh, bring us to receive his saving truth in the gospel. But he also gives us new hearts. It doesn't just stay at the the head. It goes down into the heart. He gives us new hearts to believe this gospel, to fling ourselves on Christ, to rest in its promises. But not only that, he gives us a new heart that wants to obey, that is so thankful to God for what he has done for us in Christ, that he gives us a new desire to obey. He gives us a desire to do what pleases him. So if we struggle this morning to walk in obedience which I guess we all do, I know I do, then we need to look to Christ. We need to rest in Him. We need to ask for God's help. God has promised to help us. We need to make use of the means that God has given us to help us. And it's by grace that we grow in obedience. No one can boast. We all need help. It's God, as one commentator puts it, who works faithfulness in us. So let us go to the fountain where we will find our help. Secondly, we find this incredible promise, I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is a promise God um, has restated throughout the Old Testament, but we see it way back in Abraham or with Abraham in Genesis 17, um, that God promised to be Abraham and his offspring's God and they shall be his. And in Jesus, God makes people his own. He makes them from the nation of Israel, from um, that ethnic background, uh, but his promise is extended to the nations. That's why we're here today. We're, we're not from the Middle East. We're from um, Northern Ireland. He engrafts in the Gentiles to make a new family. And by faith in Jesus, we too in this tiny island belong to this family. As his people, we have fellowship with him, therefore. We are his people and he is our God. We have communion with him in another word. He knows us. And verse 11 reminds us that we can know him. We can know him from the least of us to the greatest of us. Under this new covenant, all kinds of people will know the Lord. Um, There will be no longer required mediated access to revelation. Revelation is complete in Christ. This verse doesn't mean that we don't need teachers. Uh, It doesn't mean that we don't need ministers or elders. Uh, It doesn't mean what I'm standing up here is a bit useless or we don't need I don't need to do this this morning. Um, It's quite clear from the rest of the New Testament that we still have ordained teachers of the Word. We have Sunday school teachers. We have parents and other people who teach us to know the Lord. But we'll one day know the Lord in such an intense manner where we'll dwell with Him fully that we will not need teachers. We will not need brothers and sisters to tell us know the Lord, for we will know Him. This is what we should long for. Dare I say, to be with God as our God and we be his people. And one commentator puts it this way. The greatest reward of the gospel will be seeing God himself. Have you ever considered that? Do you long for that day when you will see God? 
Is seeing him your greatest joy? Folks, we don't come to Christ. We don't rest in Christ by faith just for what he gives us. We come to Christ so that we may know him, one day see him, and enjoy his beauty, his goodness, his majesty. And finally, the third blessing of the new covenant, the forgiveness of sin. Verse 12 reminds us, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Under the old covenant, on the day of atonement, and the priest, the great high priest would have sacrificed an animal, sprinkled its blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat was where God's wrath was poured out on the substitute for the people. It's so that the high priest, the representative of the people, could actually meet with God. In Exodus 25, uh, verse 22, God tells Moses, it's at the mercy seat where I will meet with you. Paul later picks this up in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. He talks about the propitiation. He calls Jesus the propitiation. Um, propitiation, the word in the Greek um, that we get it from, um, is the same for the free as mercy seat. Jesus is the mercy seat. The place where our sins are born. He bears our sins for us. He represents us. He spills his blood on the cross for us. He turns God's wrath away from us so that we might receive grace, forgiveness, and cleansing. And it's through Jesus that we meet with God. It's through Jesus we are reconciled to God. Don't we see how serious our sin is that um, Jesus had to die? That's how costly it was to forgive. This morning, as we hear these promises, maybe for the first time, Maybe for the 500th time. Let's not lose the awe and wonder of uh, the promise for us. In Christ, God will forgive because of our priest's sacrifice on our behalf. And he will remember your sin no more. Not that God you know, doesn't know things. It's that he will not hold them against you as their wages have been paid by Christ. Remember the covenant condition. Remember um, how you receive this grace. It's through Christ by faith and repentance, turning and trusting, turning from our sin, flinging ourselves on Jesus, we are in need of this, every single one of us. So serious our sin is, we're deserving of his judgment, we're deserving of his wrath. If you've never come to Christ this morning, I plead with you, come to Christ. He is gentle, he is lowly. He will receive you. He will forgive, no matter what you've done. He is gracious. Come, rest in him. What the old administrations, the old covenants pointed to, Jesus, the covenant priest and king, fulfills. That's why he's the better priest we have. We don't need to go back to relying on anything other than Jesus. He's offered the sacrifice of himself in the heavenly place, the best place, the better place for our eternal salvation, our eternal redemption, our eternal forgiveness. He's the one for who we receive new minds, new hearts, new desires to actually follow Christ, to obey him. This morning, if we feel weak, if we feel helpless, if we struggle with our sin, as we, trust, as we seek to trust in Christ, as we follow him, well, this chapter gives us great hope. It gives us food for our weary souls as we labor and walk in these days. We have a high priest right now in the heavens. He's worked salvation for us. He brings full and final forgiveness. And the good news is, he's no shadow. He's not something that you try and grasp and there's nothing there. He's not here one moment, gone the next. Jesus is the substance. Jesus is our high priest. So we can rest. We can rely on him today. My question is, do you rely on him this morning? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your final word, that is Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can rest in him, that we can be sure of his work for us, that he keeps us, that he intercedes for us, that we belong to him by faith. We ask that you'd help us rest, help those of us here who struggle with assurance, to find that assurance by looking outside of themselves and running and flinging themselves on Christ. 
We pray that you would continually renew our minds for your word, that you would change our hearts by your spirit to love what you love and hate what you hate within us. We pray that you give us a growing desire to walk in a way that pleases you, that glorifies you. Yet above all, we thank you for your enduring, faithful promise that you will be our God. We will be your people by your grace and your working. And it's in that that we rest and give thanks to you. We pray for those in our church family and those known to us who are struggling at this moment. We pray for those who have had surgery recently, who are struggling with health, um, who are undergoing difficult relationships, worries about children, worries about school and work. We pray that um, through their great high priest, those who trust in you would find comfort, and that you would comfort them, you would give them strength, that if according to your will, that those who um, are of ill health would recover. We pray for their ongoing strength and rehabilitation in the days to come. We pray for our government at this time as well. We ask um, that even amidst the complexity of what they have to decide, we pray um, for them that you'd give them wisdom. You'd give them eyes to see what is most important. You'd give them charity towards each other. And that you'd give them grace for those that they work with. We pray that whatever restrictions are in place, that you would sustain us not only as individuals, as a church, but also as a nation, so that many would come to know Christ, that many would rest in his priestly work on our behalf. And we pray you would make us willing, you would make us bold, you'd make us um, able to proclaim your gospel um, to our friends, our family, our neighbors in this time. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. Well, as we've been considering our great high priest, um, in the heavens, Jesus Christ, our King, in who we rest and live. Let's respond in thankfulness as we sing the appropriate priest before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. I know it's hard not to sing the song loudly and joyfully, and there's such comfort and truth for our hearts, but let's keep our seats and let's sing to the one who made an end to all our sin. Let's sing together. You know the drill as we head out and um, you guys on the left can head out that door you guys on the right head out that door if you're in the middle just hold off a moment and give each other the space and um, they require our benediction 
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.